I asked each one of those to share this morning because what's happening to them uh, is, is causing a, a moment of great celebration, right? It's a, great, it's a time to give God glory for what he's doing um, over um, our lives. And it's always good to take a moment of pause and celebrate those things. But I also bring that up to point out that it's when we're in the midst of our most exciting times that the enemy is working overtime to try and quench what God is doing. It is in those times that we must be, as Peter said, sober and vigilant, knowing that the enemy prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. This morning, as we continue our examination of Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, we come to the portion of scripture that represents the first time in Paul's writing as to the reason behind his writing to them, the first time in his letter, as to the reason behind why he's writing this letter. Up until this point, there has been a lot of encouragement to the church, this church that had been in existence about five years at the time of Paul's writing to them. He's encouraging them. He is, he is highlighting the, the person and, and nature of Jesus Christ, which was clearly under assault, uh, a, a heresy that was um, being spread around the church at Colossae. He has been setting the table up until this point about his concern for the church and what his concern really was. And so if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn together to Colossians chapter 2 and see if we can tie in all that's been happening in the last 10 minutes with what we see taking place in the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1, let's take a, we'll just get a little backdrop here. Paul writes, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Look, he says here in verse four, this is the first time we see him addressing this issue. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to your, see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now we're going to return back to that text at a later date, but I want us to go a little further in verse 8. See to it, he says, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul reveals his purpose in writing to them was so they would not be deluded, that they would not be deceived. He was concerned that they would fall prey to the deception that was around them. I mentioned earlier on that the church of Colossae was about five years old at the time of Paul's writing to them. Before that, everything was going well. They were a church plant. They were a new start. There was excitement in their midst. They were growing. They were, they were thriving. They were experiencing wonderful and exciting things taking place in their spiritual journey. In other words, their teens were on fire. Their women were on fire. Their men were on fire. Things were going good. The church was starting to grow and great and move forward. However, before the battle that Paul is addressing was ever brought into the church, there was a battle going on over the church. In the midst of this young church, this church's excitement and growth and wonderful things taking place, there is a spiritual battle going on over the church long before it entered into the church. 
before the first person embraced the, the false teaching that was being promoted in the church. There was some groundwork that took place by the enemy of their souls that created a breeding ground for deception. No one just, no one just enters into deception mode. How many know there's groundwork that takes place? There's, there's things, there's thoughts that get dropped into that person's thinking. There's something going on outside of their initial awareness before that insult, before that attack is being introduced into their life. And you see the error in the church of Colossae was the manifestation of a prior spiritual attack against the church. The problem wasn't in the church. The problem was, was over the church. And when an unguarded heart is confronted with a spiritual attack, it becomes a breeding ground for deception. Did you hear me? When an unguarded heart is confronted with a spiritual attack, it becomes a breeding ground for deception. These next couple of weeks, while we're going to continue going through the book of Colossians, we're going to kind of do a little, a little sub-series within our Colossians series. We're going to call it, Don't Be Deluded. Because that's the purpose of Paul's writing this letter to the church at Colossae. He is addressing, he is answering much of the deception that is going on. And we're going to see a beautiful display of the, the rich theology and Christology that's taking place. And we're going to celebrate and everything else about that. But let's take a moment of pause and take a step back and realize what was taking place in the church of Colossae was there was deception. There were lies that were going on. And you see, whenever we consider the subject of deception, we must take a moment of pause and consider the source of of that deception, the father of lies, the devil who is the embodiment of lying and deception. To just trek on through and not recognize that before there was error in the church at Colossae or in any other church, there's a spiritual battle that was taking place. And so this morning, we're gonna take a look at the importance of, of recognizing spiritual attack in our midst before we fall prey to it. How many would like to recognize the attack before we become prey to it? Right, we need to train ourselves in being aware of the fact that we are in a spiritual battle. And I understand there's a balance and all that. There's a healthy tension that needs to exist. We shouldn't be walking around thinking there's a, there's a devil behind every bush. But we need to keep aware of the fact that it may be a devil behind every bush. And he is trying and working over time in that church and in ours to slow down, to confuse, to divide, to bring hurt in the areas that we celebrated this morning as well as many others. And so this morning we're going to take a look at recognizing the spiritual attack. Next week, we're going to look at how do we identify false teachers? How do we identify, what are some of the characteristics of false teachers? Then the week after that, how do we identify false teaching? How do we determine something is not true? And then we'll wrap it up by how do we guard against being deceived? Because it's laid out very clearly for us in the scriptures. I want to shine light on something that the enemy seeks to keep hidden in secret. The very fact that he is always trying to sow seeds of discord and discouragement and division. He is always looking to sow seeds of discord and discouragement and division. We are need to be recognizing spiritual attacks recognizing that we are on the battlefield and you who engage in this thing called Christianity, whether you signed up for it or not, have been drafted into the army of God and we are at war, folks. 
There's a very real enemy who really doesn't like you and doesn't want you walking in the blessing and purpose of God for your life. You and I are in a spiritual battle that's going on all around us all the time, and it takes place, it takes place in an unseen arena and then manifests itself in our daily lives. Now, that might sound kind of esoteric and creepy and weird and very unevangelical, but we see this war taking place right from the beginning when Satan said, has God really said, you shall not eat of the tree? And we see this strategic attack of the enemy woven all throughout the scriptures. And so we ought not to be ignorant of those very things. I know this was preaching that became very unpopular for a season because everybody was kind of like, oh, let's just not blame everything on the devil. And the devil was very happy saying, good, they, they, they're forgetting about me for a little while. I can really get in there. And we need to be willing, we need to be exposing and aware of the fact that the enemy has not gone away. And he doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to thrive. He doesn't want your children to be on fire for God. He doesn't want our ladies to be on fire for God, our men being men on fire for God. He doesn't want that. Listen to what Paul says into the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's pretty strong right there. That sounds like a soldier that's out to war. That's a text that's written for you and for me. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. It doesn't stop right there though. It says now you need to do something. Here's where you need to take the initiative. He says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The very clear indication here is if you don't put on the armor of God, you become prey to the schemes of the devil. And that's exactly what was taking place in the church of Colossae. And it happens in churches all the time. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So who do we wrestle against? against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this dark, present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That, here it is again, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So where, where does this battle take place? Spiritual forces, cosmic powers, authorities, rulers. Where does it take place? He says to us, in the heavenly places. You remember the story of Job? God, Job comes into the presence of the Lord and God says to him, have you, have you, have you seen my servant Job? There's nobody like him in all the land. And, and, and Satan is like, you know what? He's like, you know, of course, you know, of course he serves you. Of course he loves you. You've been so good to him, but take, take his health away and he'll curse you to your face. What was the goal of Satan? The goal of Satan was to get Job to curse God to his face, to curse God and die, right? And so God's like, for reasons we'll never understand on this side of eternity, he's like, that's fine. You know what? You have at it. I'll, I'll use Job to show you that there will be people who will serve me just for me. And the storms came and he lost his wealth and, and, and he lost his children and he lost his health and he lost his money and he lost everything. And there he is in a, in a season that I pray nobody ever has to go through again. And he cried out and he said, naked I came into this world and naked I'll go out. But what's interesting is, everybody remembers that story, right? What's interesting is his friends come and they all kind of come and tell him, well, this is why you're going through it. God bless those people, right? They'd love to tell you why you're going through what you're going through. We, we love them. And, um, but notice what his wife says. His wife comes and she says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? 
Why don't you curse God and die? Where did we hear that before? When Satan said to God, I'll get him to curse you to your face. The same words that took place in the unseen manifested itself in the scene. It came as a whisper into the ears of Job's wife. Curse God and die. Where does this battle take place? It takes place in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Look with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul writes and says, for though we walk in the flesh, we're walking in the natural, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience comes. The battle takes place. It starts out there in the heavenlies and then it begins to manifest itself. Where does it begin to manifest itself? It starts to manifest itself in strongholds, in arguments, in opinions, in the knowledge of God, and in thoughts. Where do all these things take place? Where do our thoughts take place? It's all taking place right here in the mind. That conversation between Job and God took place in the heavenlies and got whispered into the ear of Job's wife and it manifested itself in her mind and came out her mouth as an attack. We need to be very aware of the way the enemy is very strategic and intentional. Notice what he says here. Take captive every thought. Take captive every thought. Let me just get real honest with you. That's, that's where it all takes place. Let me, let me introduce you to, to my world oftentimes. Oftentimes I'll be laying down in bed late at night, three, you know, asleep and wake up with a little pain over here. And the first thought that comes in is, oh no, I'm having a heart attack. And I, I can't have a heart attack. I, I, not, not here. What am I going to do? And it starts to manifest itself in anxiety. And I start thinking to myself, I can't get carried out of my house. It'll ruin my kids. It'll, and, I, and, and, and the fish, and then all these other thoughts going in the ambulance. Who's going to take care of my wife? Who's going to take care of my kids? Are my bills in order? Is my life in order? Are my, is the church in order? How's it going to go? It's a whole barrage of thoughts that come in. They manifest itself in fear. And you may think, oh yeah, but you can handle it. Let me tell you something. I have been on my, I have been on my knees sometimes saying, God, take this anxiety away. I understand it. I really do. What is it? It is a spiritual assault against my mind to rob me of my peace, rob me of my joy, rob me of my purpose. And what I need to do, and oftentimes I do, is when that thought comes in, I take it captive. No, that is not a heart attack. I should not have eaten so late at night. <laughs> I take captive those thoughts. I am not going to dwell on that. I'm not going to think on that. I'm not going to allow that thing to land and take root and begin to sprout thoughts of fear and anxiety and worry and everything else. And you know what? The same goes through. It is true in every other area, by the way. Who does he think he is? He snubbed me. He always snubs me. He says he's a Christian. This whole church, who do they think they are? They don't have the love of Christ. What is that? It's the enemy. That's how he operates. He starts to put in thoughts into each other's lives. 
And see here, and here's why I'm bringing it to the table this morning. Right now, things are wonderful. Things are exciting right now. Things are blossoming and growing and, and people's lives are being changed and transformed. And we better not be ignorant to the fact that the enemy's gonna try really hard and work overtime to get you slandering your brother and your sister and your leaders and your ministries and everything else. We need to take captive every thought and say, no, that's not what God wants me to dwell on. Take captive every thought. The battleground is not some foreign location. It's not your office. It's not your homes. It's not your school. It's not your church. The battleground is that little six inches between your ears. And it's in those places that the enemy is sending dart after dart after dart, hoping that he can get you in an unguarded moment and you can start drawing conclusions about people and everything else to try and set you back. The source of the battle, the origin, it's in the spirit realm, but, but ground zero is not in the spirit realm. It's in our minds. It's a strategic attack to change the way we think about ourselves, about others, and about God. I don't know about you, but I can get pretty creative in the middle of night. And I'm not that smart, so where's that coming from? You know? I mean, we need to expose this stuff and see it for what it is. That's not what God has for us. He's got so much better for us, and, and we want to continue to move out. And here's the deal. There's not a person in this room, myself on the top of the list, that's not susceptible to an attack like that. There's not a person in this room. Here's the scene. Jesus is with his disciples. It is, the, it, is the year, it, is, it is known as the years of favor for Jesus. Everybody wanted to be around Jesus at this time. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. It was, it was like, it, it was an exciting time to be around the ministry of Jesus. And here he is. He's with his disciples. Matthew chapter 16 and verse eight, uh, 13, it says, And when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you're John the Baptist. Some others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus is like, what are people talking about? They're like, what, who do they think I am? And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up. Peter the rock. He's like, man, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus gives him praise, like, Peter, blessed are you. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, he's revealed this to you. This wasn't something you were taught. Man, you got that download directly from the throne. Blessed are you, Peter. Peter's like, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Peter was feeling pretty good about himself. I mean, we all, we all feel good when we drop the right bomb, right? It's kind of like, bam, like, that's right. I'm on my game right now. Things are going good. Things are going great for Peter for a couple of verses. <laughs> not, not decades later, not years later, not, 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 not like chapters later, but three verses later. Look with me, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus is like, here's my purpose for being here. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind, there it is, your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Talk about going from hero to zero in four verses. One moment he's getting a download from the throne, and the next he's getting an upload from the pit of hell. What do we see here? That out of the same person, even someone as godly and loving towards Jesus as Peter, that same person can carry the potential of hearing from God 
We're hearing from Satan. And what we need to do is arrest those thoughts and determine whether it's from God. From where was the origin of those thoughts for Peter? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The origin, Jesus declares, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. My father told you this. The origin was from the throne. Not so, Lord. Begin to rebuke Jesus. Like, how crazy is that? I mean, that's pretty brazen. You're feeling pretty good about yourself if you think you've got the, the, the ability to rebuke Jesus. And, and, and just let's not miss the, the graciousness and the mercy of Jesus from not just be like, poof, gone. Next. Right? But he says, get behind me, not Peter, Satan. Wow, that, that, that puts things in perspective. The manifestation of the lie that came out of Peter's mouth found its origin in Satan. Far be it from you, Jesus, to be the redeemer of the world, defeating death, hell, and the grave, and rising again. It's not going to happen, was what was whispered in Peter's ear, manifest out of his mouth, and exposed as a lie from the pit of hell. But look what he says here. It's very interesting. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance for, to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So what does that tell us? When we're setting our, things, our minds on the things of man, we really become very open to the, to, to the lying whispers of the enemy. If it could happen to Peter, are we so foolish to think it can't happen to us? Every one of us. Hey, I have had wrong thoughts about people. That after it kind of comes out, we talk it through, I'm like, man, I completely misunderstood you. I'm so sorry. We, we need to recognize that what the enemy's trying to do is to slow what God is doing down. Every argument, think about it, every argument, every dissolved relationship, every misconception about God, it all takes place in the battlefield of the mind. And if we got real honest, it usually takes place without having conversations with the people who are involved. It's always those little, well, if they say this, I'll say that. When they say this, this is what I'll say. And I hope they say this because I will get them right there with that one. And like we're just, and then they finally come to meet with you and you're like, you're ready to go. You've had the conversations four times. You've got them dead and buried already. Is that how we treat our family? That's what the enemy wants to breed here. That's what the enemy wanted to breed in the church of Colossae. The deception that was taking place in the church of Colossae had an origin in hell, in Satan, and was beginning to manifest itself in the church of Colossae. Where was the church of Colossae being fed the lies that caused the error in the church? The origin was Satan, the battlefield was their mind, and the casualty was the church who wasn't experiencing all that God had for them. The origin was Satan. The battlefield was the mind. And the casualty was the church that wasn't experiencing all that God had for them. And you see, there's always a casualty when we believe the lies about others. Right? There's always a casualty when we believe the lies about other people. We need to learn to recognize when the thoughts that are being entertained in our minds are the fiery darts of the enemy and not your spiritual gift of discernment? <laughs> right? I just know people. I know how they think. Have you spoken to? Don't need to. Don't need to speak to them. I know them. When will we be willing to conclude that those are fiery darts from the enemy. That's the term, terminology that Paul used when, when writing to the church at Ephesus. He, he lay, here he is, he's laying in a Roman prison cell 
And on the other side of the, of the, cave, of, of the prison door, he's seeing this, he's seeing this guard and, and this soldier in, in, his, in his battle gear. And, his, and, and he's looking and he's saying, and he's continuing in Ephesians 6, he said, stand there for having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish, look, all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation. Where does that go? That covers your mind. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're going to unpack that verse by verse at another time. But the reality is what, what we have taking place here is Paul is giving us a strategy on how to not embrace and hold on to and allow sprout up, allow to sprout up the, 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 uh, the attacks and lies of the enemy. I find it interesting, I shared this on the men's retreat, that this instruction on how to prepare for spiritual battle follows his prescriptions on, on, of, of everything he just wrote about relationships. Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6, he's talking about how husbands ought to love their wives, how wives ought to love their husbands, how children ought to honor their parents, how parents need to take care of their children. He's talking about how the relationships on the workplace, how employers need to be good to their employees, and how employees need to be good to their employers. And in the midst of all this discussion on relationships, he says, put on the armor of God. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Because the arena that all this battle takes place is in all the relationships that we are engaged in every day. God created us for community. We are the body of Christ. We represent Jesus on the earth. That's what the church does. I shared in our foundations class this morning. I don't make a distinction between blood family and church family. I believe, and I'll go, it is my opinion, you don't have to agree with me, but that my opinion... I believe that God in his wisdom created families so that we would understand the way the church family is supposed to love on each other and, 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 and journey together and give each other. See, here's the deal. What we'd say is the reason that this person is my family is we share a DNA. We share blood, but we have been washed in the blood of Jesus. We have been united by his blood. And man, if we as the church family would love on and tolerate one another the same way we tolerate our, our, our other family. There'd be a lot less hurt and discouragement in the lives of people. They'll know we're Christians, John says, by our love for one another. Well, if that's how the world's going to see it, if you were the enemy and you hated God, and you hated all that God puts his love towards, wouldn't you want to try and break that up? Wouldn't you want to try and, 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 and sow in discord and division into that group? Well, what does that attack look like? How would you do that? What is it? it comes as thoughts. Who are all these people? I have never met them before. What are they doing in my church? They took my seat. They don't know that's my seat. Somebody needs to let them know that's my seat. I can't, believe, I can't even get a bagel. There's no more sin in raising bagels left? Who do they th These teenagers, what the heck are the teenagers doing in here? Really, they're in church? <laughs> These little ones, they bumped into me. They're in church. I know it's funny, but I know it gets under our skin sometimes. It comes as thoughts. They're getting... They, they don't care about me. They're getting clicky. I'm feeling left out. We're getting too big. We're losing our sense of family. I'm really glad my first and second son didn't feel like after we started having children. All right, that's enough. Us two and no more. We wouldn't have Johnny and Gabriel. <laughs> we need to make room for those who don't know Jesus. Let me just go on record. We are not creating a social environment. This isn't like a social community. This is a Christ community where we want people who are lost to come in and find refuge and find safety and find healing. And so they can go out and they can bring more in. That's how we expand the kingdom of God. Let's not be the one who gets in the way of what God's doing. And every one of us, myself on top of the list, has the potential to do that. 
You say, is he talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me too. Because all these examples I bring out to you, you say, well, how do you know that? Because I am you. <laughs> I've done it all myself. Take a moment to consider, am I thinking the way Jesus wants me to think about this situation? Take captive those thoughts. Am I seeing that person the way Jesus wants me to see that person? Have I gone to that person? Have I learned to understand why they feel the way they do? You see, some of this stuff is motivated by spiritual attack. Let me just kind of throw this out there too without getting too psychological. Some of it's motivated by past hurts and insecurities. And most of the time, it's a combination of both, by the way. Right? It's not just spiritual, and it's not just past hurts and insecurities. The enemy is very strategic. He's very smart. He knows how to work that insecurity you have and to surround you with people who will bring the worst out in you. But all the time, all the time, it could be a means, uh, uh, all the time, it could be a means for division or a mean for, means for greater community, the way God designed for it to be. Every one of those attacks. It could be a cause for division or cause for greater community. With this, I'll wrap it up. Philippians chapter four and verse eight. What ought we to be thinking on? Philippians chapter four and verse eight. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Apply that to the people who get under your skin. Apply that when things don't go the way you think they ought to go in your job or in your family or in your church. What's true? What's honorable? Is there anything praiseworthy? Let me focus on that. Getting back to the problem in Colossae, how do we guard against wrong thinking about God and ourselves and about other people? We recognize that we are in a spiritual attack and we take captive every thought. We say, not my mind. This is not going to be a breeding ground for your trash. Is it honorable? Is it true? Is it lovely? We examine those thoughts before we allow them to take root in our hearts. Something happened in the church of Colossae, and I don't want to read into the text too much, but I know that a church that was doing good started to get off course, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the only thing that makes that happen is the enemy of our souls. And so we need to recognize the attack and then we need to learn how to, how do you spot a false teacher? How do you spot false teaching? And how do you guard against being deceived? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, that we don't need to depend upon anybody but you for the direction and the course of life you called, you've called us to. You've given us your word. And Lord, it speaks as powerfully then as it does today. We just pray, Lord, that I pray your, your protection over this church. Father, we celebrate what you're doing in our midst. We recognize it is not by any person, but of your sovereign moving in our life. And we're humbled by that. I pray, Lord, that we as a church family, that we guard our minds that we not draw wrong conclusions about one another, about you, or about ourselves. That we take captive those thoughts, knowing that the enemy would try to confuse us. Help us to love on one another. Help us to serve one another. Help us to give each other the grace that we oftentimes need ourselves. Lord, use this body to reach many who don't know you. So many so near to us in this community who don't know you. Lord, help us to get out of the way so that the person of Jesus is seen in this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let's stand together.